This is March 10th, Wednesday, 1993. And the lecture today will be given by Thomas G. Long and the title, The Listener and the Biblical Text. The prayer and introduction will be done by Charles B. Bug, who is Carl E. Bates Professor of Christian Preaching. What more appropriate title for a hymn during a preaching conference than glorious things of thee are spoken. The hymn is number 398. May we stand please as we sing.
May we pray together. O oh God, we are grateful for the proclamation of your word and for the times when the ordinary words of some preacher became the extraordinarily good word for our lives. Bless this time together so that whatever we have brought to this place, we will leave reminded of your grace and your mercy. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. I first met Tom Long in 1984. Fred Craddock and he were teaching a class for ministers at Candler School of Theology. I thought that anyone who would teach a class with Fred Craddock must be very brave, very foolish, or very good. I quickly found out that Tom Long was very good. Yesterday, we heard preaching that moved us. An eight-year-old daughter framed in the afternoon sunlight as she dances around the room becomes the inbreak of the future. Kindness, a perfectly civil word, explodes into civil disobedience. And we all look out the window at the Presbytery meeting and wonder if the person on the street is more problem than potential and what that says about us as ministers. Tom Long is an exceedingly gifted preacher. And whatever package of gifts we bring to the pulpit, he gives us a window to see more clearly the power of what can happen when we preach faithfully. But those who have gotten to know him also appreciate his warmth outside the pulpit. While Dr. Long teaches at Princeton, he is a native of Atlanta. When I picked him up at the airport Monday night, I found out that he was coming from West Palm Beach, Florida. I thought maybe he had been on some religious pilgrimage or lecturing on something like preaching in the tropics. <laughs> what he had been doing was watching the Atlanta Braves in spring training. Maybe he was gathering some illustrations. The way that shaft of light falls on Deion Sanders as he gracefully glides to the outfield. <laughs> the inbreak of the future and the World Series. Or more probably, he was enjoying himself and nobody knew that the fan with the Bermuda shorts and the Atlanta Braves t-shirt was a distinguished professor of preaching and worship at Princeton Theological Seminary. We are glad Tom Long is with us, and we welcome him as he speaks today on the listener and the biblical text. Thank you. <laughs> In the spring of 1874, there was an event in Paris that shook the world of French high culture to its foundations. Before this event was concluded, there had been civil disorder, virtually riots in the streets, and the police had been called out to restore order. What had caused such a disturbance in polite French society? An art exhibition in the studio of Félix Ternichon. It's hard for us to imagine today any art exhibition creating civil disturbance, unless it would be the exhibition of works by Robert Mapplethorpe. But they did in those days in Paris. It was an exhibition of paintings by the rising and uprising new artists by the name of Degas, Cezanne, Pizarro, Manet, Monet, Renoir, the critics were outraged, incompetent, amateurish, they bellowed. But the epithet that stuck was a line that one art critic published in a French evening newspaper when he had taken a look at one of the paintings by Manet. He said, mere impressionist. These became, of course, the impressionist painters. And what was it about them that outraged their viewers? Well, some said it was a shift in subject, and it's true. 
The classically inspired painters painted paintings of great themes, heroic and epic subjects, biblical stories and myths and the grand themes. The Impressionists, however, painted everyday themes, a boat ride down the Seine, a picnic on Sunday afternoon. Others said what outraged the critics was not so much a change in subject, but a change in technique. And it's true. The classically inspired painters used clear and definite shapes, literalistic subjects, and bold and definite colors. The Impressionist painting seemed somehow unfinished. Blobs and swirls, vague pastels and misty shapes occupied their canvases. Most art scholars, however, believe that it was both a change in subject and a change in technique that created another phenomenon that outraged the public. It was a shift in authority from the artist to the viewer. What the Impressionists signaled was a larger cultural shift because they transferred the responsibility for making meaning from the painter to the one who viewed the painting. What I would like to suggest is that what caused such a thunderclap of outrage in the French art world of the 1870s, a hundred years later in a much quieter way, was a similar shift in American preaching. American preaching has become impressionistic, for good or for ill. Compare the typical sermon of 75 years ago to the typical sermon today, and what will you find? Well, you'll find a change in subject from the epic, the heroic, the grand theme to the everyday, the encounter with grace in the grocery store, a moment of holiness holding your own child. You'll also find a shift in technique from the clear, definite shape and move, point one, point two, point three, to fluid movement, narrative structure, image richness, and a sense of incompletion. Most of all, you will find a shift in authority from the preacher to the hearer. It is now the responsibility of the hearer to join with the preacher in creating the meanings that are there in the sermon. It's dangerous, of course, to date such a shift, but I'm going to try to do it anyway. One could do worse, I suppose, than to date it in 1971 when there appeared in a poorly published, poorly bound book by a small university press by a then obscure homiletician named Fred B. Craddock, a book entitled, interestingly enough, As One Without Authority. What intrigued Craddock in that book was not the question, why do bad preachers produce bad sermons? There's no mystery there. <laughs> what intrigued Craddock was, why do good preachers produce bad sermons? Why do responsible, energetic, imaginative, hardworking, and diligent preachers produce such ploddingly dull sermons? There is, he claimed, a loss of energy between the study and the pulpit. What happens is that in the study, the process is one of discovery. In the pulpit, the process is one of debate. In the study, the preacher does not know what to say. There is simply a Bible and a blank sheet and a process of putting together clues, following this lead and that one, putting them together until at the end of the process, the preacher says, ah, oh, ah, ah, that's what I'll say, has an air of excitement about it. Then the preacher takes that excitement into the pulpit and turns the discovery at the end of the process into the thesis at the beginning, my thesis for this morning which is then unloaded on the congregation in three or more deductive packages. What, said Craddock, if we were to replicate in the pulpit the process of discovery in the study? What if the preacher were intentionally to construct the sermon so that at the end of the sermon the congregation arrives at a eureka, aha, so that's what this is about. 
Sermons need, therefore, to become, in Craddock's view, slightly unfinished, like impressionistic paintings, or like Budweiser commercials on television. <laughs> you sing it through twice and then sing it halfway through, and the viewer sings the whole line, and the viewer is caught. What if sermons were built that way? To seduce, in a sense, to evoke the hearers into the process of co-creating the meaning. Craddock said this, the good artist is able to resist imperialism of thought and feeling. A work of art does not exist totally of itself, but is completed by the viewer. Nothing is more disgusting than some religious art that is exhaustingly complete, so overwhelmingly obvious. The viewer has no room to respond. Edward Albee, the playwright, said anyone who bought a ticket to see one of his plays had to assume some of the responsibility for the play. Anybody who comes to hear one of these new kinds of sermons has to assume, thought Craddock, some of the responsibility for the creation of its meaning. Sermons have become impressionistic. Over the next couple of days, what I would like to do is to evaluate this shift toward the listener in preaching. I'd like to be positive about it, and I also want to be critical of it. Today, I want to pick up a piece of it. Namely, the shift toward the listener in the understanding of the biblical text. There has been a concomitant shift in biblical studies matching the shift in homiletics in which biblical texts are now also understood as intentionally created to invoke listener or reader involvement. This reformation in the understanding of the biblical text will impact preaching for decades to come. It has already done so. It will change the way church school teachers teach. It will change the way people study the Bible for, them, for themselves at home. It is not the only reformation in biblical understanding to which we are the heirs. In fact, one could easily name several others that shape the task of biblical preaching. The first one would want to name, I think, is the Reformation that occurred at the Reformation. The one that went under the banner Sola Scriptura. Now, we Protestants have a tendency of painting the Roman Catholic Church with one brush and that entirely negative. As a matter of fact, the Roman Catholic Church had it basically right. The Bible, they claimed, is to be interpreted in the context of the church. The Bible makes sense only among believing, worshiping, and practicing people of God. It makes no more sense outside of it than a TV guide would make in a land with no television. It is a document for the community that practices and believes its claims. But the Bible in the context of the church in an illiterate society quickly became the Bible in the context of the clergy. And the Bible in the context of the clergy quickly became the Bible in the context of the magisterium. And the Bible in the context of the magisterium quickly became the magisterium. And sola scriptura was, in a sense, a slogan. It never was really scripture alone. It was the restoration of the biblical word as a force in the interaction with the community of faith. The fact that there are Bibles in the pew racks in front of you is a legacy of that Reformation. The next Reformation that impacts biblical preaching occurred 200 years ago or so, and that is the move toward historical criticism. And that was the discovery on the part of the church that if the Bible is the word of God, it is also the product of human creation, and it has historical fingerprints all over it. The Bible was created in a particular context, and it is important for interpretation to know that context. In the contemporary period, we have also added to that a discovery that the context in which the scripture was created was politically and economically charged. Just to give one example, we think that the community out of which the Gospel of Mark came and to which it was addressed was probably a lower socioeconomic group. 
You remember when the disciples are debating greatness, Jesus in Mark turns to them and says, if you want to be great, you must become as a servant. Note the language. If you want to be great, what does that imply? They aren't great. You'd like to be, but you aren't. If you want to be great, you must become as a servant. Same conversation takes place in Luke, but this time it's placed at the Lord's Supper, at the Last Supper, and Jesus turns to the disciples and says to them, those among you who are great must become as those who wait on tables. Note the shift. We think Luke had a kind of mixed economy. Those among you who are great, there are some great ones out there. If you are great, you must become as those who serve. By the way, when Jesus sends out the disciples two by two, he tells them, among other things, take no money. In Mark, the Greek is take no copper, no pennies. In Luke, it's take no silver. In Matthew, he adds take no gold. The disciples in Matthew's church were going out with American Express gold cards. <laughs> Historical circumstances that form the context for listener involvement in the text. The next Reformation that impacts us occurred 50, 75 years ago, and that was the discovery that not only did the biblical writers write in a historical context, they were no mere neutral observers or, or uh, objective journalists. They were theologians, and they wrote in order to create theological impact. For example, when the Gospel of John, unlike the synoptics, places the cleansing of the temple at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, it's not because there were two cleansings or because John didn't know and put it in the wrong spot. It's that John has a theological interest. He believes that Jesus is the embodiment and therefore the replacement of all the festivals and symbols of Judaism. And therefore, at the inauguration of his ministry, he cleanses the temple in order that he may replace it with his own body and life. Theological purpose in the Gospel of John. The recent Reformation, however, adds to these. By claiming not only did they write in historical circumstances and for theological purposes, but the biblical writers were poets impressionistic artists who used language self-consciously to cause the listener, the reader, to be involved in the text such that the thing that's being talked about actually happens in the consciousness of the reader. For example, the writer of the Gospel of John, again, an absolute genius in terms of these literary and poetic devices, has one that he uses half a dozen times or more. I call it question, answer, dumb response. <laughs> Here's the way it works. Somebody will ask or imply a question of Jesus. It'll be a good question, but it'll be at the mundane, ordinary, routine level of life. Jesus will answer the question, but he will answer it from the point of view of eternal Logos Christology causing the answer to whistle right past the person who's asked the question and evincing from them some banal response. It happens half a dozen times in the Gospel of John. The woman at the well is a great example. She says, why is it that you, a Jew, ask of me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink? That's a good question. Why is it that you, a Jewish man, ask of me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink? Answer, if you knew who was asking, you would have been free to ask him and he would have given you living water. <laughs> Where are you going to get this water? You hadn't even got a bucket. <laughs> Question, answer, dumb response. Now, the effect on the reader, of course, is after you've been through that loop a half a dozen times, you finally get to the place that you say, wait a minute, he doesn't mean the water in the... He means... And when that occurs, the miracle of the Gospel of John has begun to happen. It's a literary device designed to create an impact, an involvement on the part of the listener. 
I was reading in the Gospel of Luke the other day and got to the place where Luke says, and the women and the others who were with Jesus watched the crucifixion from a distance. I thought to myself, that's odd. Why does Luke care to tell us how far away the women were from the cross? Does it matter if they were five feet, 50 yards, five miles? Why does he say they watched the crucifixion at a distance? Well, the Greek word there is, is macron. It means from afar, at a distance. And I decided to see if the writer of Luke Acts ever used that word in any other place. No, oh, does he ever? Fifteenth chapter. And he said to himself, I will arise and go to my father and say, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. But while he was still Macron, his father ran to him. Eighteenth chapter. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One of them was a Pharisee, the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and said, Oh, God, I'm glad I'm not like other people. I'm not an extortioner. I'm not a deceiver. I'm a tither. I'm not even like this jerk over there. This jerk over there hung his head and stood. Macron. Oh, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. It's not just a measure of distance. It's a measure of humility. It's not just a yardstick, it's a theological concept about the posture of human beings before the grace of God. By the way, do you know how Peter concludes his Pentecost sermon? This good news is for you and for your children and for everyone who stands macro poetry of the text, designed to generate insight and impact in the reader, the hearer. Now, I've given you, I hope that you have it, a copy of uh, a few texts that as far as there is time, I would like to take a look at this morning to sort of get a hold of some of the poetic artistry of the biblical writers. The first one I'd like you to look at is on the side that says Mark and has the first chapter of Mark. Now, when I was a teacher at Columbia Seminary, one of the very first assignments that we would give in a preaching class is, we want you to preach your very first sermon, and you are to preach it on any passage that you choose from the first chapter of the Gospel of Mark. <laughs> a lot of good passages in there. You can pick any one that you want, but it has to be within the first chapter of Mark. Interesting thing was, approximately 70% of the students selected the same passage. It begins in the 35th verse. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place. And there he prayed, and Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, Let us go on to the neighboring town, so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. Now, why in the world would 70% of the students pick that text? Well, you understood it when you heard their sermons, which were as predictable as the choice of the text. They went like this. Jesus had had a busy day in Capernaum. He'd been teaching and healing and ministering, and he was burnt out. And so he got up early in the morning, and he went out to the Azalea Garden, and he knelt down for some quiet time with God. And you know, friends, when we're burnt out, we ought to, well, they were burnt out. That's why they were doing that sermon that way. <laughs> Not this text. The word deserted place, lonely place, is in Greek, aramon. It means desert, wilderness. And by the time we encounter it in the 35th verse, we have already encountered it several times in the first chapter of Mark alone. Look at verse 3. The voice of one crying out in the Aramon, 
Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the baptizer appeared in the Aramon, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Verse 12, and the Spirit immediately drove him out into the Aramon. He was in the Aramon 40 days, tempted by Satan. All of the Old Testament imagery of desert and wilderness pours into this word. This is no azalea garden. This is where the holy and the demonic vie for human life. This is where divine vocation is at serious risk, where temptation occurs, where the winds of peril blow. And early in the morning, Jesus went out to the desert to pray. And you just know temptation is going to find him, and it does. There you are. God, we've been looking for you everywhere. C come on back. People love you in Capernaum. Come on back. What's he going to do? Is he going to go back and be Capernaum's wonder boy? Or is he going on to Calvary? Let us go on, he said. That is why I was sent. The fact that the gospel is here today is because out there in the desert, he resisted the temptation and was faithful to his vocation. The poetry of the text, a single word, Haramon. Look over on the other side, and you will see a passage in the sixth chapter of Mark, which also contains this imagery of desert. But it also has another literary feature in it designed to perk up the ears of the listener, to sharpen the eyes of the reader. Uh, it's a kind of speed breaker, a literary speed breaker. And you know what a speed breaker is. You're driving down a road and suddenly your car hits a bump in the road. And it's a warning. Slow down. Just slow down here. There's a speed breaker in this text for the reader. Slow down. See if you can find it. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. He said to them, Come away to an Aramon all by yourselves and rest a while, for many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to an Aramon by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. When it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a desert. <laughs> Get the idea this is a desert? And the hour is now very late. Send them away so that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy something for themselves to eat. But he answered them, You give them something to eat. They said to him, Are we to go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, How many loaves have you? Go and see. When they found out, they said, five and two fish. Then he ordered them to get all the people to sit down in groups on the green. He ordered them to get all the people to sit down in groups on the green. Green grass? Now there's a speed breaker. First of all, Mark is not a technicolor writer. He does not say Jesus was wearing a tan robe with matching sandals standing under an azure blue sky. <laughs> He's an immediately kind of writer. It's plot and movement for Mark, and so suddenly we move from black and white to technicolor, green. Not only that, but where are we? We're in a desert, and suddenly the grass has begun to flourish. Now, the readers of Mark are better at the Old Testament than we are, and probably the first thing that crashes into their minds, evoked by the poetic imagery of green grass, is the promise of Isaiah, the desert shall blossom. When? In the Messianic age. Get it? Not only that, he ordered them to get all the people to sit down in groups on the green grass. He made them to lie down on the green grass. <laughs> he maketh them to lie down. 
That's familiar. <laughs> How does that begin? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, which throws you right back to verse 34. He had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Whew. The poetic language of Mark has galvanized in the consciousness of the hearer the Old Testament promises of shepherd and Messiah, poetry of the text. While we're with Mark, let's look at the 13th chapter. This is the ending of what is known as the Little Apocalypse, or to put it in popular theological terms, the ending of the discussion in the 13th chapter of Mark about the second coming, and it ends this way. But about that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, only the Father. Beware, keep alert. You don't know when the time will come. It's like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Therefore, keep awake. You don't know when the master of the house will come, evening, midnight, or at cockcrow, or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. Now, flat-footedly, what this means is, I don't know when the second coming is going to be. The angels don't know when it's going to be. Only God in heaven knows when it's going to be. But I'll tell you what it's going to be like. It's going to be like a man who goes on a journey and he leaves the servants in charge of the house, but he doesn't tell them when he's coming back. So they always have to have one of them watching at the door to make sure that the house is clean and neat and ordered when he comes back. He, we don't know when he's going to come back. He could come back in any of the four watches of the Roman night. He could come back at evening. He could come back at midnight. He could come back at cock crow. He could come back in the morning. Could come back in the evening. And when it was evening, Mark tells us, he was with his disciples and said to them, one of you will betray me. Could come back in the evening. Could come back at midnight. Later that night they went to the garden and he said, watch while I pray. And he prayed that prayer with great drops sweating off his body and he came out of the garden and he found them Could come back in the evening. Could come back at midnight. Could come back at cock crow. Weren't you with him? No. Yes, you were. I recognize you. You were with him. No, I was not. And the cock crew. Or it could be morning. And when it was dawn, they took him and handed him over to be crucified. Notice what he's doing here. He's organizing the passion story around the ticks of the clock to say that the advent is not simply something we stand up on tiptoe and look for over the edge of the horizon of time, but there are chances for loyalty and betrayal, denial and faith built into every moment of the day, evening, midnight, cockcrow, morning, poetry, the text. Now, James is a sermon, and therefore I need to preach it. <laughs> and I'm going to preach it in such a way that I hope that you will see what is one of the funniest non sequiturs in all of the Bible. Listen. Come now, you rich people, weep and wail for the miseries that are coming to you. Your riches have rotted. Your clothes are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have rusted, and their rust is going to be evidence against you. It'll eat your flesh like fire. You listen to me, you have laid up treasure for the last days. Listen to me, the wages of the migrant workers who mowed your fields, which you, you have kept back by fraud, they cry out, and the cries of the harvesters have reached the very ears of the Lord of hosts. You've lived on the earth in luxury and in pleasure. You've fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You, you have condemned and murdered the righteous one who does not resist you. Be patient, therefore, beloved. No, no, no. What's happening here is we know from internal evidence that the readers of the original sermon of James were themselves the migrant workers. 
They were the poor. They were the ones who had been defrauded and taken advantage of. And so their preacher, Brother James, at a significant point in the sermon, strides across the chancel, raises the sanctuary window, and shouts at the big house at the top of the hill, you listen to me. You have defrauded, you have cheated, you have swindled, and you have oppressed, and the cries of the migrant workers and the farm laborers have reached the very ears of the Lord of hosts. You fattened yourself in a day of luxury. Well, your day is coming, I assure you. Be patient. Be patient, brothers and sisters. Now, they can't hear him at the big house, wouldn't care if they could. But they can overhear him announcing what is surely the coming justice of God. And the poetic effect of the text is to generate encouragement among those who have been pressed down. One more text. We have time for only one more. It's Luke 17, 26 through 30. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so too it will be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking and marrying and being given in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed all of them. Likewise, just as it was in the days of Lot, they were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But on the day that, that Lot left Sodom, it rained fire and sulfur from heaven and destroyed all of them. So, it'll be like that on the day that the Son of Man is revealed. Again, a flat-footed interpretation would say, the day of the Son of Man's revelation is going to be a tough day, and I can give you a couple of Old Testament examples to prove it. The experience of Noah, the experience of Lot. Robert Tannehill, in his writings on this text, says, listen to the poetry of it. Listen to the poetry. And when you do, it sounds like this. As it was in the days of Noah, so too will it be in the days of the Son of Man. Eating, drinking, marrying, being given in marriage. Why would I read it that way? Because I'm trying to express the way the Greek sounds. They're nya nya words. Ebonon, esthenon, agonon. Their design, said Tannehill, to create the very thing they're talking about, the, excuse me, the sort of ordinary rhythms of life. They were eating and drinking and marrying and the crisis happened in the middle of the rhythms of life. Likewise, as it was in the days of Lot, eating, drinking. We've heard this list before. We know what happens at the end of it. Buying, selling, planting. Oh my God, the list is getting longer. I don't know. I know, the, I know it's coming, but I don't know when. I, I, it's coming, but I don't. Note the posture. The text creates the very anticipation of the crisis in the middle of the routine and ordinary that it's talking about. In other words, the biblical writers were preachers, and they picked language like good preachers always do not simply to express the truth they were describing, but to create in their listeners the event of the gospel. How do we do that? To that end, I shall address myself tomorrow and the next day. Let us close with prayer. For all of those faithful witnesses, O oh God, who spoke in poetry, doxology, and song of your mighty acts, we give thanks and pray that in our preaching we might be faithful to their vision and to their sound. In the name of the one who is the word, even Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.